measure the success of not selling their grain, and Dave Town will tell us if the pleasant weather will continue. All that's next on Two Action News. Your Lincoln Mercury dealers want you to know that whatever you're doing... Dad, you better get over here. Get big savings on Mercury Cougar. Save up to $695 on an option package, including speed control, AM, FM, stereo, power windows, and air conditioning. And that's in addition to all these standard features on Cougar. Save up to $695, and that's just the beginning. You better get over to your Lincoln Mercury dealer and discover his low, low price. Mercury Cougar, at the sign of a cat. <laughs> At Bishop's, you'll find something good for every taste. The New Tech Times, a video magazine for the electronic age. In this edition, Oscar the Grouch enters the computer age as Children's Television Workshop develops software. Also, flight simulators, they're multi-million dollar video games that train pilots. Later, a look at high-tech greeting cards and an introduction to holography. All this and more in this edition of the New Tech Times. The New Tech Times is brought to you through a grant from Wausau Insurance Company. Times change. Wausau works. And by the collective voice of the consumer electronics industry, CEG, the Consumer Electronics Group. Electronic Industries Association. Hello, I'm Nicholas Johnson. The new technology affects each of us in ways that are serious and silly, friendly, and frightening. And this week's New Tech Times has some of each. Brilliant computer scientists would rather design innovative hardware than creative computer programs. And as a result, our kids are running some mighty shoddy software on some mighty impressive computers. Now, that used to be said of television before Joan Gans Cooney gathered diverse professionals together like Dave Connell, who we talked with last week. They formed the Children's Television Workshop and brought us fine programs like Sesame Street. Well, now Joan sees those same TV screens filled with children's computer programs. So she's setting out to do for them what she did for network television. Here's a report on the CTW Computer Software Project, produced by Anna Ray Jones. Hmm. It is easy to use the Worm 2 computer. Oscar, what is this? It's my personal computer, nosy. But we just got a computer, and it's for everybody. Yeah, well, it's not the same. It's a grouch computer. Despite the rantings of such an old, familiar curmudgeon as Oscar, you'll find nothing user or grouchy about these computers or their software. This is the Kids Computer Club of the Children's Television Workshop, and these children are active participants in the workshop's unique approach to developing high-quality educational software. The uh, software division of the Children's Television Workshop is a little group of people that are part of CTW whose job is to produce educational and entertaining software for children and to make it generally available. It's important for us that the material embody some principles or some learning that are educationally valuable for the child. It's important that the child um, easily and flexibly can accomplish the task that the software presents to him, whether it's playing a game, whether it's doing a particular kind of activity, the child must be able to master the interaction with the computer. It flows too fast. We're particularly interested in issues of how children um, uh, get inside the computer and do the task that needs to be done because we've learned that the exact mechanics of performing a task or playing a game can either really facilitate children's ability to interact with the computer or make it totally opaque and totally impossible for them to handle. A preschool child might be already exposed to what goes on in a zoo. You know? Like other CTW products, the software group's objective is to combine education and entertainment for the benefit of children. There are no singular software superstars here, just a very dedicated group of teachers, researchers, and child education specialists. They're not in cages, they're not maybe what we would in natural They're in natural yeah, habitats. Sure, sure. We have, uh, of course, the programmer who writes the code, but we also have an artist and um, 
researchers, uh, creative people, educators, um, uh, mu musicians. So we, we have a whole range of expertise really working on one product. Who knows, some pro somebody might not even know about a gorilla. Who, you know, we're completely different than that. Along the way, we have the researcher who is saying, this seems appropriate, this doesn't, should we try it, can we try it this way? And that person is also responsible for doing field research, taking the product out into daycare centers, public schools, private schools, to bring back feedback. Aside from its educational value, the software must meet other basic criteria. It must be age-appropriate, non-violent, non-judgmental, and must appeal to both boys and girls. This game is called Cookie Monster Munch and is a pre-reading program for four-year-olds. They like to be in control, I think, as, as we all do. And I think that one thing that we're very aware of is giving the child control, letting the child learn as he or she wants to learn. Um, or, or play the game as he or she wants to play the game. Now, the goal of this game is to, to move Cookie Monster through the maze to pick up the cookies on the pads. Since there's only one cookie, this is the easiest level. The child only has to do a very simple task before getting a reward, because you know the child wants to know that he or she has accomplished the task. The latest crop of CTW software is being produced in collaboration with Atari and CBS. But by far, the most important partners in CTW's efforts are the children. Well, I think games are I think an important part of learning about computers, what they can do. But I don't think that's the whole thing. I'm, I like to program. I have my own computer. That's what I use it for. And um, I think if you just buy a computer to play games, it's not really worth it. I like good graphics and um, an exciting game. Um, also, a game that has a lot of options, where you can do a lot of things with it, and a game that you don't get bored of. The club is conducted by researcher Harold Bird. It tests games that emphasize multi-level strategies and cooperation. Okay, Wani, what do you think of the game of tag? You have to think very fast in this game. You have to think fast. Is that good or bad? Well, you think too fast. You have to think too fast, so it's pretty bad. So we need to do something to slow it down for most people then. Mm -hmm. It's a frequent complaint from parents and educators that there's very little good software on the market for kids and that manufacturers aren't often sensitive to a child's educational needs. With their standards and methods, CTW's growing presence in the industry promises to raise the level of children's software. Of course computer games teach. As I used to say of television, all TV is educational. The only question is, what is it teaching? Now, much of the teaching and other computer activity has been spurred on by the military. One example is a kind of video game called a simulator. This technology was developed to train the military to launch missiles and fly planes. Now that same technology is being used to train commercial pilots and entertain you in your living room. Here's a report on simulators produced by Steve Jandasek. As technology in society becomes more complex, so does the problem of training those who must use it. Chicago Center, the American Science 67, we lost standing pressure. We are presently in emergency descent passing through the food zone. Food zone request instructions preserved. This pilot is heading for an emergency landing at Chicago's O'Hare Airport. If he misses the runway, he'll get another chance, because he's not really in the air. He's perched atop this maze of hydraulic arms and electronic cables. This is a flight simulator for the Boeing 767, the new generation of computerized jets. Think break. Think break. Think break. Think break. Think break. With digital computer technology and actual flight data, these simulators look, feel, and respond just like the real thing. Six cathode ray tubes, like small TV screens, have replaced many of the cockpit's old gauges and dials. Computer graphics now display airport runways and other flight information on screens in front of the pilot and co-pilot. The motion base creates the sensation of flight by moving the simulator through six different axes.
It could be said that this is the ultimate video game. The first comment that you frequently get from someone who's gotten into the simulators, that's the, that's the biggest super video game I've ever seen in my life. And ever since the first person ever said that, you know, we've tried to figure out how to make little green men come up on the windows. Select the box. Okay. We have a fire engine. engine number fire. Engine. Engine. number yeah. two. All right. But it's more than just a game for the American Airlines pilots who use the simulator to learn to handle emergency situations safely, many of which cannot be practiced in flight. 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. Nice touchdown. We're trying to remind the pilot constantly that uh, he is really in a semi-real atmosphere. But what he does in that cockpit uh, is going to reflect essentially and eventually on what he does in the actual aircraft. So every cue that you can put in there that makes it seem more realistic is important. Flight simulation training is also available for helicopter pilots. From a position behind the training pilot, an instructor can program over 250 different flight failures. Aircraft and helicopter simulators are so real that pilots can earn flight credits for time spent in one. Almost any airport in the world can be accurately displayed visually under every possible kind of weather condition. We now have simulators uh, in this country which uh, will allow a pilot to go from the beginning of his training in a particular type of aircraft right through to the end and never see or never touch the real aircraft and yet uh, when he leaves the simulator he can go on line as a revenue pilot. Two, one, zero. We have ignition and we have liftoff. Realism has come to the home video market as well, complete with computer generated visuals, motion and sound. Here we go. And if I get 90% of T plus zero, the solid rocket boosters will start at T plus three. And we're through the clouds. This is Activision's new space shuttle video game designed for use at home by Steve Kitchen. Here we are. We're over 100 nautical miles up now. The it's not an ordinary video game. From the pilot's viewpoint, the player has to watch several computer screens while moving the shuttle through launch, a rendezvous and dock with a satellite, and return safely to Earth. It's a total departure from the standard way games are played. It's a simulator. It's a game cartridge that fits into a game machine. But, but the game machine, it's transferred, translated into a home computer. We're talking about home computer games. This is a home computer game with the graphics, with the detail, with the play value that's in a home computer. We've put it into what was originally a video game machine. That's a departure. Secondly, it's real life. It's themed totally on what is today newsworthy. It's scientific, but it's fun. People understand it, people enjoy it, people relate to it. It's not dry scientific, it's fun scientific. And I think we have them. And we've run it. I'm now ready for re-entry, I can even... And if you successfully complete the mission six times, you can earn your flight wings from Activision. Here we are, and there are the mountains. And the runway is in the middle, as far as I can tell, the lower, the lower right-hand screen indicates the line up with the runway. There it is. And the left-hand screen is the glide slope. I have to remain between those two lines to accurately land. I'm now checking my range and my altitude on the way down. I want to keep myself in that glide slope so that I land right at the end of the runway. Not too early or I'll plow into the desert floor. Not too late or I'll run off the end of the runway. And the crosswinds are heavy. Here we go. Here we go. Okay, we're down below the crosswinds now. Now I gotta keep myself accurately. I can't drop too fast. I'm bringing my nose up just a hair to catch a little bit of extra lift here. As soon as I go over the runway, you'll hear a high-pitched beep. There we are. Put my landing gear down and push my nose down. 
my front nose gear down, and we're down now. And we've successfully landed at Edwards Air Force Base. If you have story ideas or comments, send them to the New Tech Times, 821 University Avenue, Madison, Wisconsin, 53706. Or just call the source or CompuServe. Simulators point out a recurring theme that we've seen on the New Tech Times. Sophisticated technology costing millions of dollars is developed for a military or an industrial use, and then becomes available for all of us a short time later for a lot less. Another theme is the role of innovators in this fast-moving business. One who captivated me at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas was Nolan Bushnell, who's given us everything from Pong to pizza parlors with robots. I wanted to share some of our conversation with you. Here he is. Would you like to pay less for a new video game? Would you like to have more control of coverage of sporting events on TV? Randy Wright, touchdown! Some people have a knack for turning ideas into reality. Such a person is the man who invented video games and started the Atari Corporation. Nolan Bushnell was the founder of numerous commercial ventures. He talked with Nicholas Johnson about one of his new companies called ACTV. Um, what it is, it's a way that cable operators can bring interactivity to the home, uh, but it's very customized interactivity. Um, it's a microprocessor. You have a button, or four buttons on a box that you hold in your hand. And the television asks you questions. And uh, it gives you so much power uh, in your home to, uh, to become an editor. As an example, if you're watching a football game, you may wish to watch the game from the end zone or watch the end as opposed to the quarterback. Or uh, watch... Uh, various other things so I instead of how you can do that i mean if they have someone at the game if there's some editor there and a, okay what, what we do is we multiplex four channels and give you the power rather than giving it to some editor you have the screen and the screen's like this and then on the side are the three pictures yeah. that you're not that, that you're not seeing and you push any one of the buttons and it pulls it in bushnell's trying to increase your options for tv viewing through live coverage and packaged video games. Another new Bushnell company is called Kuma, with a product known as MetaWriter. It allows you to recycle video cartridges. A lot of times you end up with a game or a piece of software that's a lot of fun, but that it's, um, but you get tired of it. And so we've designed uh, uh, ROM-based cartridges that can be upgraded. So you go down to the store, put the cartridge in, uh, and you can you can actually distribute software much more inexpensively then. And so for a few dollars, you can change that program and take it back and have a new game or a new software piece. Bushnell is into everything from software to pizza parlors, but his big project now is robotics. He says his company called Androbot is backlogged with orders for electronic servants. I just know that robots are going to be the biggest thing since canned beer and sliced bread. I just know it. And, uh, you know, and, and I'll wager you right now that the robot is going to be one of the strongest uh, items on the Christmas list of every 12-year-old in America in 1984, September. That soon? Yeah. Number one. And I'll bet you money on it. Nolan Bushnell, a visionary with a lot of irons in the fiery, fast-changing world of new technology. There are, of course, many electronics innovations for which Nolan Bushnell is not responsible. Take laser beams, for example. The laser is a little beam of light, but with many talents. In the hands of your eye doctor, it can perform delicate surgery. A contractor might use it to drill through a mountain. To a telephone company, well, it's a more efficient way to carry phone messages. And to an artist, Ah, laser is the magic wand that creates three-dimensional artworks called holograms. Here's our report. You're looking at a photograph, a new kind of eerie three-dimensional imaging called holography. 
It's a way to make a picture come to life. Sometimes it's hard to believe your eyes. It appears to be a magician's illusion, but it's not done with mirrors. Holograms are made with laser light. A beam is refracted through optics and directed onto the subject of the hologram. Images are recorded on a special photographic paper. Several layers of the picture are produced, so when you move a hologram or when it moves on its own, the image gains depth and texture. You can take a look at this new technology at the Museum of Holography in New York City. Artists are very attracted to holography because of its um, inherent two-dimensional and three-dimensional qualities. An artist can actually use uh, light in its purest form, and in holography we, we find that the laser light allows a much more uh, direct manipulation with color. So instead of using applied color the way that a painter would, would use, the holographers are actually working with a light pencil, which is what the laser light is. Holography is also being used in business. MasterCard is putting 3D emblems on plastic money to prevent forgery. In Sweden, they're used on corporate ID cards. It's nearly impossible to duplicate a hologram, but a computer can produce the effect of a hologram on a screen. It's done by blending a composite of computer graphics. Right now, the way that computers and holography interface is through computer-generated holograms. And these are a special type of hologram which is made, generated by a computer, and then a hologram is made of the computer drawings. And in this way, people can visualize what an object would look like before they actually make it. Holography is used by manufacturers to draw mechanical parts. Engineers can tell if a piece will break or malfunction before it's put into production. Very few people know about holograms because the use of them has been limited. They're expensive to produce, and sometimes it's hard to really see that three-dimensional quality. Holograms are also difficult to photograph for TV, but if you could look at this eagle with your eyes, it would appear as if you could reach in and touch its wings. Someday, holography will permit me to enter your living room in three-dimensional form, to walk about, sit in your chair, yet let you walk right through my body. Fortunately for both of us, that's not likely to happen for quite a while. We have found a less threatening use for holograms, however, the simple greeting card, which along with a lot of other electronics, promises to make the 25-cent birthday card a thing of the past. Here's Gary Probst's report. When you want to say something to that someone special, but are too shy to do so in person, you reach for a greeting card. It's a way to use the creativity of artists and poets to express your thoughts sometimes better than you could yourself. Valentine cards, Christmas cards, birthday greetings, many kinds of cards have been around for centuries. At Hallmark Cards in Kansas City, new technology is now being used to change the way cards deliver their message. The cow that you see here was probably done in the late 50s or early 1960s with the sentiment, as you see, I'm in the mood for love and as it opens, the eyes twirl. And to show you that there's really, uh, in greeting card sentiments, while we continue to write new types of uh, ideas for consumers to send, in this instance, we use the same sentiment again. And with the two bears, we open up and it says, I'm in the mood for love. Banks is holding one of Hallmark's new musical cards. The music comes from a computer chip. When the cards are produced, workers install a microprocessor, battery, and speaker. Quality control includes opening each card to check the electronic tune. The price of a Hallmark musical card is $7. Consumers are paying for disposable electronics. The people at Hallmark believe they'll be able to improve the sound quality of the card by putting more information on that microchip. But the next step for Hallmark is talking cards. We lost our video. Do not adjust your card. We'll continue with our audio. The talking card is being test marketed on the East Coast with a price tag of $10. Another big project for Hallmark is the holographic card. 
It's where lasers are used to imprint the image of a finely sculptured or live object. A hologram gives a 3D effect. Ron Raymer creates works of art for the laser to photograph. Then the holograms pick up such delicate detail that uh, we found out from the first ones that we did that <laughs> every little mistake's going to show up. So, and believe me, I had plenty of them to show up. Uh, so you've got to try to get as much detail as you can in the fine area, realizing it, it's going to be viewed like as if the viewer was looking at it from a two inch uh, two inches away. We would like to produce a true color hologram where you could in fact have a rose that has all the pinks and the greens to the leaves and so forth. And who knows whether that's months away or years away or if it will ever be. As new technology develops, the people at Hallmark will try to use it in greeting cards. Customers will be communicating more through electronics in the future, and they'll expect consumer items to keep up with the times. The sentiments on the cards may stay the same, but the methods of expressing them will be subject to change. From greeting cards to simulators, educational computer software to holograms, these new tech times seem to be affecting virtually every aspect of our lives. Surrounded by advertising hype on the one hand and the byproducts of military electronics on the other, you and I struggle to understand what's happening. I hope this week's show has helped you, as it has me, and that you'll be back next week when we take a look at these stories. In the next edition of the New Tech Times, home video dishes and scrambled signals, the controversy heats up over who owns the airwaves. Also, a review of Apple's new Macintosh. It's a major departure from most computers. This and more in the next edition of the New Tech Times. So join me then, won't you? For the New Tech Times staff, I'm Nicholas Johnson. One examines the battle against childhood asthma, visits a Marshalltown man who received the gift of sight at the University of Iowa Hospital, and recollects about the battleship USS Iowa. Watch Take One tonight at 8. Times has been brought to you through a grant from Wausau Insurance Company. Times change. Wausau works. And by the collective voice of the consumer electronics industry. The to move the U.S. Embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. I think in a general way would be a, a mistake, a bad move to make. That's the point. And I'm glad to say that the president uh, has kept his head about him in all of this and is staying with that position. And Schultz ridiculed Gary Hart's proposal that all U.S. forces be pulled out of Central America. It's ridiculous. My gosh. Uh, this is an area of vital significance to the United States. It's an area where we're on the right side of things, where we are supporting democracy, where we're supporting the rule of law, where there are lots of people who we want to help in their economic development, and we better stick with it. While berating the Democrats' foreign policy positions, Schultz insisted that Washington had no advanced knowledge of a vital power shift which took place yesterday in Honduras. The Armed Forces Commander, Gustavo Alvarez, suddenly was forced into exile and a number of his deputies removed. If that's the case, critics are sure to question whether the U.S. ought to have known more about an area so sensitive and often described by Schultz as so vital to U.S. interests. Dennis Trout, ABC News, at the State Department. In Honduras today, there were indications that even if Alvarez's demise did come as a surprise and despite problems it could create for the U.S. in the region, his departure was greeted by American officials with some relief. That story from Latin American Bureau Chief Ann Garrels. With the head of the armed forces out of a job and out of the country, President Suazo appeared on national television to say democracy in Honduras has been reinforced. General Alvarez and President Suazo had long competed for power. That Suazo won out surprised everyone. But the president had the crucial support of much of the military. They shared his objections to the high-handed way Alvarez ran things. 
They were offended by his corruption, his meddling in politics, and his apparent tolerance for growing human rights abuses here. President Suazo also had at least the tacit support of the U.S. According to both Honduran and Western sources, the U.S. had also complained about Alvarez's behavior. Though he more than supported U.S. aims in the region, his style was creating problems and counter-